Hi, everybody. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today on our webinar. My name is Rose Myron, and I'm the program manager for the National Native American Boarding School Healing Coalition, or NAVS for short. Um, I'm going to be hosting the webinar today as our newly promoted executive director, Christine Dindisi McCleave, is actually giving a presentation at a day of reconciliation and healing at the Mount Pleasant Indian Industrial Boarding School in Mount Pleasant, Michigan. So I want to welcome everybody today and just thank you all for joining us. We're really excited to be hosting this very important conversation about historical trauma and about healing um, and to have Dr. Roberta Paul with us, who I'll introduce in just a moment. Uh, so first, I just want to go over some of the logistics for the webinar today. Um, as you can probably tell, you are all muted, so you won't be able to chime in verbally with any questions. Uh, but you do have the option to type questions or to type into the chat feature. Uh, if you have any questions for Dr. Paul, um, I'll be compiling those as the webinar goes along. Or if you have any issues with technology, you can always use the chat feature to message me while the webinar is going on. And all of that is on the right side of your screen, um, where you'll see there's a place for chat, questions, and to raise your hand. And I'll be monitoring all of that as the webinar is going on. And then finally, I'm just going to ask everybody to stay tuned at the end of the webinar today for just a couple of important announcements from the coalition and to hear a little bit about part two of our webinar series. Uh, and again, I know many of you have tuned into previous episodes, but for anybody who's new, I just want to give a brief overview of NABS and the work that we do. So NAVS is a 501c3 nonprofit, and we were started in 2012 in response to a growing call to recognize and raise awareness about the history of historical Indian boarding schools um, and to really address the lasting trauma that came from those schools. Today, we're a coalition organization of both Native and non-Native individuals and organizational members, uh, but our board of directors and our executive staff is 100% Native American. Our programs focus on education, advocacy, and healing around the history and the impacts of boarding schools, and these webinars are really a part of our educational efforts and our goal to raise awareness and educate the public about this important topic. The vision of NABS is Indigenous cultural sovereignty, and that really guides this work. And our mission is to lead the pursuit of understanding and addressing the ongoing trauma that was created by the U.S. Indian boarding school policy. So without further ado, I want to introduce our speaker for today, Dr. Roberta Paul. Dr. Paul is an enrolled member of the Nez Perce Nation, and she was born and raised on the Nez Perce Reservation. Her paternal grandfather, Jeff Paul, was a survivor of the Nez Perce War of 1877, and he was one of seven Nez Perce children that were sent to the Carlisle Indian Boarding School from the exile camp. Dr. Paul holds a bachelor's degree in science, in, bachelor's of science degree in clothing, textiles, and design from the University of Idaho, a master's degree in psychology from Eastern Washington University, and a PhD in leadership studies from Gonzaga University. Her dissertation was on historical trauma and healing, and it involved researching five generations of her family history. Through this, she developed a healing model for understanding the historical trauma that has impacted her family. Dr. Paul recently retired from Washington State University, Spokane, where she served as the Director of Native American Health Services and directed the Nahashni Native American High School Health Science Institute. Today, she continues her research, and she continues to mentor and work with Native American high school and college students. She's also an affiliate faculty member at Washington State University Plateau Center, and she serves on the University of Washington Native American Advisory Board and the Southwest Tribal Institutional Board. Throughout her career, Dr. Paul has been recognized as a woman of distinction at Washington State University, as well as being awarded an Enduring Spirit Award from the Native American Action Network, among many other honors. Today, she's going to be giving a presentation on historical trauma and healing. So, without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to her. Okay, Dr. Paul, you should go. You can go ahead and share your screen. Show my screen. Okay, I clicked on it. There it goes. All right. Tots Good morning. Good morning, everyone. I'm so honored to be here and. I also want to pay homage to, this is D-Day of 75 year anniversary. So I want to recognize those survivors and, and, and also the, the war effort that we had. So today I'm going to be talking about historical trauma and the boarding school experience. So this is one aspect of, of boarding school and trauma. And again, I'm Robbie Paul. Uh, and my Indian name is Tulikawisama, woman of the forest. 
And I'm just going to, you know, give you a brief uh, didactics of, of historical trauma. So those who have not had this or not familiar can understand. So historical trauma is unresolved grief. It's cumulative and that there is collective compounding and second wounding over time, both over a lifespan and across generations. So traumas kind of build up on each self. And I will show that example as I talk today. And the symptoms are mourning resolution is incomplete and can be manifested as prolonged signs of acute grief, depression, substance abuse, somatization. And my family have all experienced every one of these. And so we're still in the process of healing and understanding, and, but we are on the healing path. And the trauma responses are the constellation that features in reaction to a traumatic event or a series of events has been called the trauma response and encompasses symptomatology such as war neurosis, post-traumatic stress disorder, and psychic trauma. So these, you know, it's multi-level, the historical trauma uh, syndrome. So it's very complex, but, you know, you can get through it and understand it. And so the interdivisional transmission, which I began to understand when I went through a divorce, is the transfer of features or symptoms across generations from the survivors to their descendants, is delineated as intergenerational transmission. This nomenclature appears principally in the trauma and Jewish Holocaust literature, but now more and more of our native uh, researchers are adding it to our body of Native American researchers and in there. So what contributed to our historical trauma and, and passing it on is the conspiracy of silence. So the transmission of unresolved grief happens with the first generation who experiences the trauma. So they either do not share the story of the trauma because it's so awful they just can't, or they share only bits and pieces are shared. So not a complete picture is known, but the children are aware of the omnipresent feeling that is left. And that happened several times in my family history, thus leaving the children of the survivors having absorbed the omnipresent feelings and unspoken grief. So for me, it was when I went through my divorce, I began to and heal from my divorce. I understood you know, the anniversary dates of going through you know, your first date and things like that. But then as that went away, I began to feel, there were other times in my, I felt depressed during the year and I couldn't figure out, well, why do I feel depressed still? And that led me to go look at um, my family history. And then I began to realize that lined up with the Nez Perce War, there were certain times that, that I felt depressed and other family events in my family that that left those, those ucky feelings that you had certain times of the year. So that began to line that up. So understanding your family history and going through that is helps you know un, undo the conspiracy of silence. So the children of survivors they'll they'll still manifest the Holocaust behaviors of their of those who experienced it first, and the anniversaries of their traumata will experience painful bewilderment, but do not understand. So that's where I felt I didn't understand why I felt such a, so depressed certain times of the year, and it really lined up with uh, what I found to be the Nespers War and and things like that, and I'll share more of that and as I go through. So storytelling, I believe storytelling is one of the aspects of learning how to heal and how to find your story, but story is very important, and it's very, very cultural for us to tell our story. Even though we were told not to know our culture, we still need to tell our stories. So the Native American author in Scott Mamaday says, storytelling is an act by which woman man strives to realize his for her capacity for wonder and delight. Man tells story in order to understand his or her experiences, whatever that may be. So I just firmly believe that storytelling is really important and finding your story does help heal. So the power of storytelling, it is very powerful to discover self, how our lived experiences contributed to the conspiracy of sciences, Yes, it just happened in my family. I asked my dad sometimes, would grandfather ever talk about the Nez Perce War? And dad says, no, but those feelings still got passed on even though they weren't spoken about, but he experienced a lot of trauma in that war and also boarding school. So I'll share that more. The process of storytelling can be the beginning of healing, but as tell the story, must listen to what I am saying because listening to the ancestors by using my voice. So I, as I began to heal, I'm beginning to realize I'm helping heal my ancestors. They're the ones who couldn't talk at the time because the experience was so traumatic, but that's why I had to listen to the ancestors to find out where it is that we begin to heal. 
so I can go help heal the generational wound that occurred. And I began to understand that and realize this through a saying that I heard at a Healing Our Wound Experience conferences that Chief Burke said, he says, you have to listen to learn and learn mm -hmm. to listen. This is an aspect that I've really learned and understand. My father used to tell me when we were growing up that he can listen to the birds sing and predict how the weather would be. And I says, well, how did you do that, Dad? Well, uh, he says, I have a strong why I can. A strong why I can is our spirit guide. And I'd ask Dad, well, how do you get your strong why I can? Well, it's vision quest. And well, how do you do that in vision quest? Well, you have to listen. You have to learn to listen and listen to learn. And he said this to me. He says, you have to listen so carefully that you can hear a bird take a drink of water on the other side of the mountain. Now that was deep listening. I've, I've learned to practice that. I'm not perfect at it, but it is hard to become so quiet that you can hear ants crawling on you, your birds singing on the other side of the mountain. But that was part of the healing journey for me was to go actually lay on the earth because that's very part of the healing and to learn to listen and listen to the ancestors who are coming to you to know where they want to begin to heal. They want their story told. And that's the intergenerational trauma that we need to help heal. So how do you begin to heal the unresolved grief? What cannot be talked about can also not be put to rest. If it is not, the wounds continue to fester from generation to generation. And that has been proved time and time again. What doesn't get talked about will just fester and become the elephant in the room and gets passed on from generation to generation. It can be scary to confront those monsters, or, but you can do it. I'm here to say that, yes, that can happen, but understand those wounds. you got to understand the wound before you can heal it, but you got to identify the wound in the generation that it occurred. So the story of the boarding school, this is where I'm going to begin because we have three generations in our family history of the boarding school. The legacy of boarding schools is one aspect of historical trauma. The story has been told in bits and pieces and the recognition of how the assimilation process affected Native American students is now being made aware. The beginning of healing and understanding the effects has begun. We're just in the beginning stages and I hope as we tell our story more that more can come and join us and help heal. So that's what the Healing Coalition of the Native, National Native Boarding School is, is to help heal. So begin with Carlisle. It was the very first government Indian boarding school. It was created in 1879 to 1918 in Carlisle, Pennsylvania. It is now a US Army War College. And you have to get permission to go on there, but I've been there many times. And I'm gonna begin on my story because begin just prior to the boarding school for our people was the Nez Perce War. This is my great grandfather, Seven Days Whipping, Watat Oinat Lehenne. He was of the Joseph Ban. He was the father of Jesse Paul and husband of Phoebe Lowry. They had six children, but only one survived, and that was my grandfather, Jesse Paul. All died during the Nez Perce War of 1877. We are not sure where or, or where or when Seven Days Whipping dies. Either he died on the trail or died in exile, but we don't can't find a record of where he is at. But I see him and I see his spirit and knowing it is it is time to heal. And this is his wife, Phoebe. This picture was taken uh, in about 1890. But I look at that picture and I see a woman who is not defeated. She has given me much strength. I encourage you to look at your photos if you have old photos, because they will speak to you. She is the wife of Seven Days Whipping and the mother of Jesse Paul. She was born about 1838 and died in 1918. She witnesses the deaths of five of her children and her husband. So I asked the question, how does she send her only surviving child to boarding school? And how does she survive and go on living? Those are questions I had to ask because I don't know if I, if I was a mother and I saw five children die, I don't know if I could go on. So that's a trauma in that, in that generation that I've had to help her heal. And mostly I hear from her is, don't forget my children. 
So nobody wants to be forgotten. They want to be remembered in the battle that they survived or did not survive, but to go to recognize and honor them. So, so surviving trauma, I started looking at other uh, history. And I found this book called Man's Search for Meaning by Viktor Frankl. And with he survived the Holocaust. And within this, I gleaned a saying, if you have a why, then you can survive the how. Uh, this became a question I would ask of each generational trauma that I would ask myself, what was their why and how? So as I identified each wound in each generation or wounds, there's more than one wound in each generation, I would ask that question. And that helped me to look differently and how to find the history and look at you know, what, what helped them to survive. Here's Richard Pratt at Carlisle. Uh, he lobbied Congress to take over Carlisle, which had served as a base for the Civil War. And then policy was changing. The pulpit press and Congress were recalling for a major overhaul because they were just not, things were not good. And so the goal of the Reformation was to civilize the Indian. And the three areas of focus was Indian land holdings, which led to the uh, Dawes Allotment Act, education, which led to boarding schools and citizenship, which was part of that overall goal. Richard Praff had a belief of how to educate the native people. In Indian civilization, I am a Baptist. I believe in immersing the Indian in our civilization and we get them under holding them there until they are soaked. So that was his belief and that's how, you know, immerses totally in white culture. He would establish enough Carlisles away from the reservation and its influences to accommodate all the Indian children of the United States. And from these prep schools and civilization feed into public schools and thus into mainstream America. There are over 565 boarding schools that were created. And he, this was the mothership. And there are still those who are in existence. One of them is Chamao, which I'll talk to you about a little bit. He wanted the American Indian to succeed and become equal. And he was considered by many to be an advocate for the Indian. So yes, he went against the grain of thinking that Indians could be could even be educated, but the process was harsh. So his assimilation though was to kill the Indian and save the man. That was the harm that caused, but it didn't affect all of us. It did affect a lot though. But upon arrival, stripped of their buckskin, given my baths, haircut, put into old uniforms for men, women were to wear dresses and they were given English names. My grandfather had arrived as Kakuni, was given the name Jesse Paul by Richard Pratt. And there was the outing experience that Pratt believed in, that he believed that they needed to be trained in how to become a farmer. That was the thinking that as all the immigrants came, they wanted to become farmers too. So he believed in the outing experience where the young man would live with a family for six months, and sometimes that was two years, which my grandfather did to learn the farming skills. They then would return and have education in three R's. The young woman would also be sent to area farms to learn domestic skills. Some would see this as, as uh, free work. Uh, they did earn some money. It wasn't, you know, it wasn't a par, but there was some funding made, but some was free and some were abused in, the, in those avid experiences. So one of the students that was there at the same time my grandfather was, was Luther standing there. And so this is an example I share of what happened when they first arrived. And, uh, and Luther standing there and his group arrived in November of 1879 when the first group arrived from Rosebud Reservation. <clears throat> so his is what he says in his book. But when my hair was cut short, it hurt my feelings to such an extent that the tears came into my eyes. I do not recall whether the barber noticed my agitation or not, nor did I care. All I was thinking was that hair he had taken away from me. Now, after having had my hair cut, I felt that I was no more Indian, but would be an imitation of a white man. None of us slept that night. So I, I think about that when my grandfather, what he would have thought when his hair was cut, because when he arrived, he went through that process. And here's the sign that is there in Carlisle when you come into the town and it shows that they still recognize that, but there are many people there who don't even know that the school existed at that time, even though there are markers in the town. 
but it says there are over 10,000 indigenous, indigenous children who attended the school in that time period of 1879 to 1918. And it does say it did leave a legacy of conflict and hurt and there are graves. So the intergenerational experience I'm going to share is from my own experience of my grandfather. I was attending a suicide prevention conference here in Spokane, Washington, and I was early in the stages of understanding uh, historical trauma and generational trauma, and they were showing a video titled In the White Man's Image, and it was a documentary about the beginning of Carlisle Industrial School. And in this, I saw a visual of what happened to the children when they arrived. It was the stripping of their buckskins, the live ass, the haircut, put into a wool uniform. And then I had an overwhelming feeling of being sick to the stomach. I literally had to run out of the room and go to the Spokane River and throw up. It so overwhelmed me. This is called a secondary PTSD. I had had a little knowledge of grandfather attending boarding school, but did not have the details of what happened to them on their arrival. So seeing that visual just really hit me really hard. And I went home that night and laid on the couch with my thumb almost in my mouth. And I saw a picture on the wall that I had there. And I had a picture of these five Nez Perce children who were at Carlisle. So I had been there for a long time. But then all of a sudden I noticed for the first time that grandfather Jesse had a hand inside the uniform. And I then asked myself, grandfather, why do you have that hand inside your uniform? So later that night, grandfather came to me in a dream and he answers this way. You may get the outward Indian appearance of me, but not all of my Indianness. I firmly believe he was holding onto a medicine bag that his mother had given him. And this is where I apply if you have a why you survived the how. So she had the why she had to send him with love and told him to go and learn what he can and come back to help our people. He was at Carlisle for eight years. When he leaves, he still speaks Nez Perce. He does return and helps form the first tribal government. So those are the whys and the hows for this particular part. And after I had that struggle with that night, I was able to understand and look at, at more of the boarding school experience in my family history. So I, I can understand the trigger now, so I don't let it overwhelm me, but also you had to educate yourself what happened. So to look at that. These are the five Nez Perce children who were there. So my grandfather is right here. This is my grandfather. You can see the hand inside his uniform. That's what triggered me. I just, why do you have your hand there? And this is uh, Charles Wolf and Samuel Johns. And front is Dolly Gould and Rebecca Little Wolf. There are two others that not, are not pictured there with them. They are Luke Phillips and Harriet Mary. Of, of these seven children who come from the exile camp of uh, Tawanka, Oklahoma, of the Nez Perce War, Nez Perce are three die and are buried at Carlisle. So this is their, his uh, enrollment card that is there and it shows he comes from the Ponca Unit Agency. Uh, Pratt had come to recruit them from there. This is the date that he arrives, February 20, 1880. And then these are the two dates that he's sent out to on his outing. And then it lists that he leaves July 6, 1888. So you can find these cards in the archives. They're all there. And so I encourage you to go find those, those history. And I think now they're gonna be at uh, the Dickinson College also there in Carlisle, Pennsylvania. They have them all digitized online. Not all of the students are listed quite yet, but they're getting there. So Jesse Paul's outing experience, which we have visited, is he was sent to, he was on two different outings while he lived there. He was sent to the Abdon Longshore Farm in Bucks County, Pennsylvania. And we have found this farm and then they, they are still in existence. And so he goes on April 16th, 1884 to September 6th, 1886. So he's there at age 14 and leaves at age 16. So he's there just about two years, a little over two years. Comes back and learns more skills at, the, at Carlisle and then goes for a second outing and is there for all five months there from April, March to September and he's age 17. And then, then the next year, he will get to come home. This is the largest picture that I saw, and I've had this, and I've taken a, a microphone, microscope to look, not a microscope, a magnifying glass to go look for him. And I think I found him right here, right here in the second row. That's my grandfather. So this is the picture taken. I, I 
as a family, we have gone to Carlisle to walk the grounds to kind of feel where he would have been. What, what did he see on the streets? Um, they were, all, you know, lots of people. The streets were all brick, brick. Uh, they went to churches. I'm sure grandfather went to the first Presbyterian church because he was Presbyterian because the missionaries came to us from there. And Pratt was a uh, Presbyterian, and he took his Indian children, what he called his Indian children, to the Presbyterian churches there. And so there's a town square in Carlisle where there's uh, Episcopalian church, a Presbyterian church, the courthouse, and the uh, another government building, county building. And so my grandfather was there. This is their uh, their dorm. I didn't find grandfather in this one. It's not clear enough for me to see, but he would have been in this, probably down here in one of these little Moogler guys. He was age 10 when he arrives. And here he is when they're about to graduate. And there he is in the back, back there. Uh, I do have the list of the names of all the others who were there with him. I did not post this on this uh, slideshow, but if somebody can, you can ask me that later and I can send it to you later. This is a government document and you can find it in the archives in Washington, DC. But this is grandfather Jesse here when he was ready to leave in 1888. Here I am at the Carlisle Cemetery, which is very important for me to go visit the graves and pay homage to those who are buried there. This grave site has been moved twice. So not all grave markers match the body that's in. Um, there are some are totally unidentified, uh, but I did visit and I wanted to pay homage to those. So this is Rebecca Littlewolf, who died five years after arriving. This is Luke Phillips, who died just a couple months before he was going to go home. Mm -hmm. And then Samuel Johns. And they sometimes they just didn't, you know, that's obviously not how you spell this purse, but they had different spellings. Nobody was very sure about how they spelled anything back then. They just kind of guessed. So after they left Carlisle, all the students did get a trunk. And this is the trunk that my grandfather had um, that was, came home with him and we still have it. And in this family story, we know that uh, he shipped this trunk to my father after his wife and six children die. And so, but this contains a lot of the family history that I was able to discover and understand our family history. If he had not saved that, I would not know as much as I do today. In this trunk were beaded gloves, beaded bags and other things. And then he comes back and he marries the daughter of this couple. Jane is the daughter of Chief Utes and Malican. And Chief Utes and Malican greets Wilson Clark. And he's also, she's also baptized by the first missionary who came to us, Henry S. Spalding, in 1838. So finding our story and understanding that has helped our family to understand our own family history. Before I started looking at this, we didn't know. We just kind of muddled along. And then, but Homer and Lydia, the, the children of these two, went to Chamawa and they arrive in 1883 at Chamawa and come home either 1887 or 1888. So, but first the 1883 date, they would have been at, uh, at Pacific Grove because uh, that was the first Chamawa and then 1885, they went to Chamawa. And these early records are, are not there. Here she is in about 1888, here she is in the back row. I just uh, grieve at how unhappy these children look. Um, here's the, we've enlarged this one. So this is my grandmother, Lydia. These are their cards that have been bowed, but this are done afterwards because the early records were destroyed in a fire, but they had some records somewhere because they now know that she's Mrs. Paul. So, but they arrived in 1883. And these cards are at the archives in, in Seattle. So you can find those there you want to go find your ancestors there. So, so Jesse and Lydia, they marry in 1893. Uh, Jesse comes back from Carlisle and he helps uh, survey the land with um, Alice Fletcher for the Dawes Allotment Act and chooses land on the Camas Prairie in Idaho. Together they start the Paul Ranch and it's still in our family today. So yes, Jesse, those skills he learned as a farmer, he, he helped 
with becoming a farmer. They had 11 children, two died in infancy, six died diseases as young adults, and only three boys lived to adulthood to marry and have children. One of those was my father, Jesse, my father, Titus James Paul. The deaths of the six children is another layer of family trauma that we have begun to heal. So you can see how the trauma of a war, the trauma of exile, the trauma of boarding school, and then the trauma of family life. That's, that's a lot of trauma for a family to, to shift through and understand, but you gotta find your history to know where you begin to heal. So I'm gonna go back to grandmother Lydia who attended Chamawa. And these are the autograph books that she had. And in this autograph books, there are several signatures from not just Nespers, but all from several native students from across the country, mostly West Coast natives. Um, so these, these autograph books and the calling cards, you can see how fancy those calling cards are. The top part would lift up and you lift it up and there'd be a name printed underneath. These have all been scanned in the WSU Plateau uh, portal, which will be made public here uh, soon. And I'm hoping that the descendants can go search for their ancestors' handwriting and their calling card because those early records were destroyed. So at least you'll have a handwriting of your ancestor. There are also photos taken that are, some are identified, some are not. So I'm hoping if you'll see the handwriting, you'll go look at the photos and see if you can identify your ancestor. I feel really strongly that if you know where they were and how they wrote, and most of them signed their, they had a signature already. They had numbers back then. And so in the autograph book, they would say to number 119, that was my grandmother's number, to number 119, Lydia Condit. And they would sign their name with two plus three plus four in their name or their number 248, whatever. But they, that was how they were identified. They had numbers for each student. But in a lot of them, they would say, forget me not. So I take that as really that we are not to forget our ancestors. They want to be remembered. This is how you help heal, go find your ancestor's story and, and acknowledge that they did live. This is uh, at Tom Ox Church Camp, which my grandfather helped find. They found the property up on Camas Prairie at Tom Ox. And this is the family that is there. My dad is right down here in the, here he's a small child, but he had memories of going to camp and it's still in existence. This is a Nespers Presbyterian Indian church camp that runs three weeks in the summer from late June to early July, and has been going for about 110 years, and it's still in existence. These are the young children. So this is my dad right here, 1907, and the girls, none of the girls lived, they lived to young adults, and then they all died. So, Grandfather and grandmother didn't want them to go to boarding school at a young age and the allotment after the allotments were assigned the reservation was open to for uh, homesteading so there are other families there and they had a one room schoolhouse called Cold Springs and it was only about a mile from where our ranch was and so all of the Paul children went there and then uh, others were there too and they and the one room schoolhouse went to eighth grade. But there's also a oral story in our family of that they didn't want their children to go at a young age and they heard that an Indian agent was going to come and take their young girls to a boarding school. So there was a old piano box that they had because they had a piano, but they used the piano box that was shipped in and put into the wood shop and they put wood in. So they hid the girls in the wood in that old piano box so that they would not be taken. We still have that piano box. I still have it. Uh, it's now in my house, in my wood shop <laughs> with wood in it. Uh, however, I'm gonna have to un undig it out because I'm gonna use it as part of the exhibit. I'm hosting an exhibit at WSU on the boarding school experience of, of the Paul family. And so that, wood, that piano box will be there as part of the exhibit. So these are the different schools that they went to. So we had a strong history of boarding school in the family. They're, the boys, some of the boys went to Cushman. And when grandfather and grandmother knew that they needed to go get more education, it was the thinking of the time and the in the teens. And so one night they're sitting around the table and they says, okay, we need to decide where you want to go to school. So they went around the table and some said Cushman, some said Jamala. And then when it got to my dad, my dad said, as far as way as possible. And I just kind of laughed at that when he 
and I did the interview with him and he says, were you serious about that or were you joking? He says, no, I wanted to go experience the world. So he chose to go there, but he was age 14 when he went. So there's a difference between being forced to go to boarding school or choosing to go. So yes, he chose to go to Shalako and he was there for five years. So the other children, there, these are the ones who went to Chamawa, Esther, Rose, and Alexander. These are their, you can find all these records at the archives in Seattle, at the Sandpoint archives in Seattle. They're all there, you can find. And here's Shalako. This is where my dad went. He arrived in September uh, 1922. This is the entrance to Shalako. Anybody, nobody's ever been there. It's closed now. It's owned by some Oklahoma tribes. I'm not sure which one. But it's a mile into where the school buildings are. There's a train stop on the other side where they would get off. And sometimes they're met by... Uh, by somebody to take them in or sometimes they just they'd have to walk the whole mile down that long stretch all by themselves i wondered how scary that felt if you're not familiar with the area so that's the entrance my father has taken us there many times we've gone there um, he had a good experience but he, he says if i ask him if he was ever punished he says oh yeah i was punished a couple times and, you know i spoke my language and i got i had to march in the parade grounds for a couple hours, but did it make you quit? No, oh, no, they still did it. They still went underground. So they did stick game. They did that in secret places. And they also did stomp dances. And it says, well, were you punished for that? Oh, a couple times, I mean, not, not all the time. So this, they had to have a, a turn an ear away from that because stomp dance is done with, with uh, a drum and they're down by Shalako Creek. And they do that on the weekend sometimes. And so, the people who were there had to turn a deaf ear and just let them do their stomp dances. So things still went on. Now, I'm not saying that uh, Shalako was one of the better ones. I'm, not, you know, everybody had a different experience, but different schools, depending on who ran it, what their temperament was, had good or bad experiences. Mission schools, different bad experiences. You know, there's all the experiences are from A to Z and understanding those processes, you know, abuse whippings and things like that. I mean, that's it's all over the board, but understanding that my father was never physically abused. He was made to march. So he had that kind of an experience, but overall he said he had a good experience while attending Shalako. And he here he is when he graduated from Shalako in 1927, was a handsome man. And here's his records. You know, they said that he should go on to college, but he did not, he went and become a mechanic uh but he was very good they said he was very intelligent you know so the teachers you know were good and they wanted the students to succeed at the time that he went and his class was the first class to have a four-year high school curriculum so when he graduated in 1927 his was the first class to have that four-year high school curriculum here are some of his grades he did pretty good um, i think probably better than me <laughs> some aspects so but you know he studied hard he liked it but they you know they were strict he says they are they were strict the you know, boys and girls were always separate they had marched to the for lunch they had marched to classes you know so they also had to have the room clean and everything they got a bath once a week so that's how often they got a bath this is the uniform of reuben when he went to sherman indian boarding school as a young boy um he went after after the loss of those six children. His grandfather was so grief stricken that he just just couldn't take care of his kids at the time. So he sent him to at a, you know age six or seven to this boarding school. He was there quite a quite a while, but he did come back home to Cremont, Idaho, and graduate from Cremont High School. But that was you know that's pretty traumatic to send a young boy away at that age. Here's my father and mother when they first met. So you can see that my mother was uh, non-native. My father, after Carlisle, went to St. Louis to get more training in mechanics and, and such. Then he came to our Kansas City, Kansas and got on to the Shell Oil Refinery. And uh, he asked the foreman if he knew a place to go board. And so my grandmother happened to be running a boarding house at the time, Bessie Castor, and my mother was there. And when dad came, he had another young Indian man with him. And 
So at dinner one night, my mom saw how good looking my dad was. And so she leaned over to her friend and says, I'm going to set my cap to get a date with this good looking Indian man with the two first names, Titus Paul. That was my dad. So two weeks later, they went on a walk. I mean, this is 1929. They're not, there's no money to be had because of the depression. And so two years later, they were married. It was not hunky dory uh, at first when mom started going out with dad. Her family beat my dad up. Now that was um, hard at first for mom, but then she's at her age of 16. She, she is a strong Irish English woman. She says, this is who I love and this is how it's going to be. So that eventually her family did accept dad and understand that this is who my mother loved. This is my dad receiving the Shalako Indian Hall of Fame. He was inducted in 1999 for the work that he'd done over his lifetime. He was always a very uh, gentle man, never raised a voice at me, even though he had all those boarding school experiences, but he lived 14 years at home with the parents that he spoke Nez Perce. But yes, he did lose the loss of language. He didn't speak it fluently when he came back. He did teach us a few words, but like I say, he never raised a hand to me. Always, we always respected my father. Um, I knew when I was in trouble though, he had a look. So I knew when I needed to straighten up and be good. So this is the healing model I've developed. It's uh, for our family. Not all my family has done this, but for us it is, you know, we understand that healing is a process and takes time. We have to take personal responsibility for our own healing. So yes, we have alcoholism in my family, we had drug addiction, we've had uh, depression. And so some of us are healed and are, are working through that, um, but not all. So pray to the creator for the time to go to those places in your life history that have affected you and your family. So I explain this as on anniversary dates, you gotta know where to begin. You can't begin with the most horrible wound because it's too hard to, to face at first. So the creator may lead you to a, a wound that's, you know, that you can start with, that you can understand and begin to heal. On or near the anniversary dates of the historical event, go to the physical site. So I really firmly believe where the wound occurred, you need to go visit that site, do ceremony, tell the story, begin to forgive on that goal. And it may take more than one visit, depending on how deep the wound is. And for us, the first place that I took my family and it was the big one and I shouldn't I guess I shouldn't have but I did and it was the big hole uh, battle where we were surprised attacked in the morning and that's where I lost five aunts and uncles and that's where my grandfather witnessed the deaths of his brothers and sisters where my grandmother witnessed the death of her children and so I took my father there so we could begin to heal that part of our history and we've been three times now I will have to go again to take my grandchildren so that, that we can finally heal. I don't know if I'll ever be healed because it was such a, a deep wound. There are 60 to 90 Nespers who were killed there. I'm sure not all their relatives have come back. And so it's, it's there, but the ceremony happens every year on the anniversary date. And the other part of this is respect. So respect begins with your relationship with the creator, Elevate and look to the creator for your answer to prayers. Expect excellence of yourself. Strengthen self by loving self, family, and community. Prepare yourself for whatever challenges you face. Purpose of life is a personal responsibility. Educate, be a lifelong learner. I had to dig deep to find my history, so I really encourage you to, to go dig. Create an honoring space to be with the creator. Create and contribute to the world. Trust the creator to lead and guide you. Trust and treasure the uniqueness, the, the life that is within yourself. We are all unique and we are all left by the creator. And I'm gonna close with this. Obey the creator and do good to all. It is good medicine, healing your wounds and easing your pains. Gazi Yaye, thank you for listening. So, Rose. <laughs> uh -oh. 
Are we here? Rose? Uh, Rose? Oh, there we go. How's that? Can everybody hear me? All there. Okay. <laughs> Just, ah. Oh, good. All right. Sorry about that, everybody. And then we still have technical difficulties with the system. Okay, perfect. So thank you so much, Roberta. That was wonderful. I think you've given everybody a lot to think about. Um, I see that some people have started to submit questions, which is great. Um, please go ahead and keep submitting those questions on the right side of your screen. Um, and I'm going to look at them now and moderate and um, give them to Roberta. So um, it looks like we had a couple questions um, about your research process. One person asked, um, what was the research process like for you and did you find it difficult or healing to learn more about the experiences of um, your grandfather and your grandmother in the archives and, um, or, or was it a little bit of both? I'd say it was both. Um. I definitely would pray each time I would come to a, a new uh, awareness of, of, a, of a wound. So uh, sometimes I just have to sit and cry because it hurts so much. Uh, I would smudge. Uh, if it was really, really difficult, I would sit and smudge. And But you had to feel it, though. You just couldn't pass over it. You had to feel it and go through it. You just can't gloss over the wound. You got to help the wound and that's what the ancestors are trying to tell us it's time to heal but you also you got to pray for where to begin and that's why i talk about you have to listen to learn and learn to listen and i just uh things would just fall in my lap sometimes by accident even though i was searching and sometimes i i went to for example i went to uh this one library to show somebody else how to do research and I just pulled out this one drawer and I pulled out this one folder and it happened to be the obituary of my great grandmother Jane Condit and I just oh my gosh I mean so it that's where I found out that she'd been baptized by Spalding when she was born and she lived to age 97 so things just fall in your lap uh, and when you start the process and ask the creator, where do I begin? You have to ask. So, yes. Great. Thank you. Um, we have another request to talk a little bit more about your healing model. Um, and I'm actually going to make you the presenter again so you can show that um, they want, they are wondering more about that respect slide and wondering if you could show that and talk a little bit more about that. Respect. Okay. So I put it back yep, up. There we go. I see it. Perfect. Okay. So everybody's able to see that now. Yeah, this is uh, this came to me in a in a dream. Uh, the respect, you know, begins with your relationship with the creator. I just feel you got to have that respectful relationship with the creator to help move you through different aspects of what you're looking for, and you have to elevate yourself to look to the creator for your answer to prayers and expect that excellence of yourself. Do not put yourself down. You are you the experiences you've had are the experiences you've had. They're neither bad nor good, they just are. And the strength, strengthen self by loving yourself, family and community. But you know, you gotta love yourself first. And there is a lot of into that. Uh, don't hate yourself for things that have been done. Um, it's, it's those experiences that make who you are and love your family and your community. But as you heal yourself, you're gonna get stronger to help your family and help your community. It just, it just shows and radiates. And prepare yourself, for whatever challenges you face. The purpose of life is a personal responsibility. So, for so example, I, you know, I, I had to go learn my creation story, and the creation story of the nest purse is when coyote kills the monster Kamii. I encourage anybody to go find your creation story of your tribal people, because that's going to help you give your identity as an Indian person. And so, in that story, there's a little bit at the end that, you know, in essence, the coyote is supposed to kill the monster and prepare the animals for when the human beings come. And after he's killed the, the monster, he's, he has to fling to the, all the directions the body parts, and wherever body part lands, a new nation is born. But at the very end, as he's creating the nest purse, he says, You may be small, but you'll be strong, brave, and intelligent. So that's when I began to realize I'm intelligent because I had a second grade teacher tell me I was a dumb Indian. So I had to get over that 
thing to get over our, that stereotype that had been placed on me. And when I heard that story, of, you may be strong, brave, and intelligent. At the age of 40, I'm hearing, I'm intelligent? And I literally went from a two-point GPA to a 3.7 in one semester because I was finally able to undo that stereotype that had been placed on me. We do not have to be what others perceive us to be. And so, to, so I had to prepare myself to go back to college, though, but I first had to go learn my creation stories. My, my father did tell me I needed to go learn that, and that helped me. And then to educate, be a lifelong learner, I had to go learn I learned how to educate myself. I had to learn our own st our creation stories and learn our different other stories. So that helps you to educate yourself about who you are as a native person in your culture. Each culture has their own creation story and help that to you. Create an honoring space to be the creator. I, I have a place where I go, uh, if I'm really in, uh, really need to meditate, I have a place on my property where I go and just sit and be quiet. And, create and contribute to the world. We gotta give back to the world. We cannot take, we gotta give back and help the world heal. Uh, in my early beginnings of healing, I would go home to the ranch where I was born and raised and I would just sit there and that's where I learned to listen. And that's, that's very, laying on the earth is very healing, but you gotta have a safe place to do that. So my ranch is still a safe place for me to go. I know not everybody has that place to go back to where they were born or where their reservation is, but find a place that is uh, creating for you, that's safe for you to go and meditate and be uh, on the earth. And trust the creator to lead and guide. Oh, I trust that he, there are times I don't want to hear it at the moment, but then I have to say, okay, that's something I need to learn right now. Trust and treasure the uniqueness, the life that is within yourself. Yep. I'm not through healing. I've been healing since my ex-husband left me on my 39th birthday. It'll be 30 years this August. I'll be turning 70 years old. And so I'm on the healing journey now though. And it's, you know, I'm not all the way done. I've done a lot of, lot of healing though. Um, it's, a, it's a process and it takes time. And, you, and I prayed to the creator, okay, so what's next? And so he keeps leading me. And so that's, sharing the story as part of that process. Hey, thank you. I'm sorry, I know it seems like some of you couldn't see the slide. I'm not sure what's going on. We might be having a little technical difficulty. Um, I can see it, but um, I've heard from a couple people that we can't, but I do just want to let everybody know that um, this is being recorded, and so we will be making this and our other episodes available online at a later date, so you will have access to it eventually. We've gotten a couple of questions about that as well. Um, so you'll be able to go back and listen and see the slides. All right. Um, we have another question, Roberto, wondering if you could talk a little bit more about the upcoming WSU event, the exhibition that you talked about. Yes. Uh, so I'm working with WSU libraries, their archival libraries, and it's going to be uh, October 25th is going to be the opening date, and I'm going to be... Uh, providing all this information that I've had, you know, the autograph books and the calling cards, the trunk and the um, piano box, what they hid them in and various other artifacts that my family has, has been able to save. Um, it's a miracle that we even have the trunk or the artifacts because when grandfather, when my grandmother died and his six children died, he could have destroyed all of it, but somehow he had the wherewithal to save it and send it to my father. And my mother appreciated it. She knew it was history, so she didn't get rid of it either. So that's why I have what I have, and I'm so thankful for that. I know many people's history has been destroyed in fires and stuff, so I feel very fortunate that what I have has been saved. And so this exhibit will last about probably a couple months at WSU Pullman at the WSU Library in the archives in the downstairs. And we'll have a, an opening in, in a speaker series. So. Wonderful. Thanks so much. Um, another question here um, with somebody who has started doing some research, and I'm going to read it because um, it's, it's a little bit long. Um, they said, sometimes I wish I had never embarked on learning my family's history. I had come to terms with the fact that my family had been done wrong on so many levels, and then I found an avenue to learn what happened, and it's a very helpless feeling not being able to do anything about what happened. Most of my elders have passed on, and I just don't know what to do with that grief 
that comes on so many levels and with learning the past? What do you suggest? Well, that that is that's where I have to sit with the creator in that that space and let the creator be with you. I know it is hard and overwhelming, and there are many times I felt I don't want to know this. Um, one of the hardest parts for me is to go to uh, the Nez Perce War was was pretty horrific, and going to the battle site where I lost my aunts and uncles. That's a very hard site for me to go to. But I have to confront it because I got to know my grandmother's more or less telling me, don't forget my children and don't forget their lives. And I mean, understand the circumstances. I went around the situation, but also, you know, you may not need to confront all, you know, don't confront all of them at once because that's too overwhelming. You know, you're going to kind of have to pick and choose um, and, and you don't have to do it all at once. Yeah, healing is a is a step by step process. You don't have to heal all at once. And so for me, I had to sit with the creator and and with my father when my father went to a big hole where that battle occurred, where our five uh, aunts and uncles died. It was really hard to be there, uh, but I know I'm honoring them. And I guess you know what are you that you're trying to do? You're trying to honor your ancestors even though they were wronged. Um, but they don't want to be forgotten. Uh, this is where we need to tell the story so these atrocities do not happen again. Um, and that's the process of uh, decolonization is helping us to tell the stories so we don't repeat. I know it seems like we're repeating again with the, what's going on down at the border, but we still need to keep, keep at it. But know that you are loved. No, you don't have to heal everything. You, you may not heal everything in this generation. It's, you know, it's, it may not be you or maybe somebody else. Great, thank you. Um, we have time for maybe a couple more questions. If anybody has any others that we want to submit, that they'd like to submit right now. Um, I've got one more from somebody who this is also kind of a follow-up to healing. Um, and I know you kind of, you just talked about this a little bit, but somebody who is at the very beginning of their healing journey, they're wondering what suggestions do you have for people who are just starting their healing journey and what would be maybe the first thing that you suggest they would do? Well, that's where I, I prayed. In the very beginning, I just started praying. I let, a, a, if, a, you know, I had... Going through the divorce, I realized there as many things I needed to work on on myself because it takes two for a marriage to work and it takes two for a marriage to fail. So I read a lot of self-help books to help get my understanding of myself and understand where, you know, my my part in the failure of the marriage and just take responsibility only for my part. You know, we each had our part in that. So I read a lot of self-help books. Part of me, I had to deal with uh, what I call the dance of anger with my mother. That's a book I read. Another book I read was um, that helped a lot was uh, uh, oh I'm forgetting the family ties that bind that looks at the uh, alcoholic families and their and their makeup understanding that and that I forget the name of the author but the name of the book is family ties that bind and he's wrote a couple of other books too and that was a very helpful book for me. So, and the dance of anger was another one. So I, I read self help books to how to help myself. Well, you know, what about me? Where's, where's my feelings? What did I do wrong in the marriage? So I first had to con, you know, struggle with that first. And so it's kind of a, you know, I went to support groups. I, I journaled, I journaled a lot. I also drew a lot. I drew, and I recommend that you draw with your non-dominant hand because that's where your true feelings come out. Uh, just draw, don't, feel you have to draw a perfect picture. This is not the purpose. It's just to draw. It could be abstract or whatever. It could be scribbles. And then write down and use colors. Use all kinds of colors. And then jot down on the back side kind of what you were feeling as you were drawing and then date it and then look at it six months later and then go back and look at it and look at it in four different directions. So that's that's my early process was doing that was, you know, self-help books, journaling, drawing, and finding my my space where I could just go meditate and be with the creator and let the creator guide you as to what you need to do next. Great. Thank you. All right. We've got two more questions. Um, one is, I, can you share the website where we can find the autograph book pictures? Was that what Plateau People 
uh, website, yeah, it, Roberta? It's the, it's the Washington State University Plateau Portal, but I, it's not my, it is not up yet, so I can't share that quite yet. So um, I'll send the link to everybody to the website, even if the like just the portal, so you can look yeah. at it, even if the autograph books aren't um, up yet. So yeah, I can send that. Yeah, that. I can send that later. I don't have it with me right now. No, that's okay. I can send it out. All right. Uh, great. And then um, one last question. Uh, somebody is wondering if it's okay to quote your words from the webinar on social media. Um, sounds like you've inspired a lot of people. Oh, yes. As long as you give me credit. <laughs> <laughs> sounds good. And don't miss, don't miss, do not misquote me. I've been misquoted a few times. <laughs> Very fair request. <laughs> wonderful. Well, thank you so much, Roberta. Um, this has been wonderful. Um, Feel free, if anybody has any additional questions, you can send them to info at nabshc.org. Um, and just want to give a couple of updates. As I, I know, a lot of people have asked about the webinars being available online. So this webinar episode concludes part one of our 2019 webinar series. And part two is going to be announced next month, and that will begin in August. So we're taking the month of July off, and then the next episode seven um, I'm sorry, episode six will be in August. Um, so in the meantime, we will be putting up all of the recordings from episodes one through five on our resource database. Um, and the best way to know when those are gonna be made available is to sign up for our e-news on our website, or you can always follow us on social media as well, and we'll post an announcement there when the episodes are made available. Um, I also just want to mention that as some of you have probably seen from our, if you are already on our email list or you follow our social media, um, NABS has some staffing changes happening this summer. So I'm actually going to be leaving my position as program manager in just a couple of weeks. Um, and I've accepted a new position as the director of the Dorothy Mystical Center for American Indian and Indigenous Studies at the Newberry Library. But that means that NABS is hiring two new staff members. Um, a director of research and programs and a program coordinator. So if you know anybody who is interested in working for a great organization that's working towards truth and healing, or if you're interested in being that person, um, you can check out the official job postings under the announcement section on our website. Um, and as always, you can send questions to info at navhd.org. Uh, so thanks everybody so much and have a wonderful rest of your day.